Didn't it's me, it's me. It's oh, me. Sean, you look beautiful. Oh, <laughs> 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 I'm gonna leave that in there. That is some quiff, that. <laughs> <laughs> quiff no, I, think, I think, I think, I think that's the answer to us from the beans question later that's on. The intro. Yeah. Oh no! Nah. <laughs> ben Hardcastle's got some competition. Oh, love it. Hello and welcome back to Ashton United TV and another episode of Robin's Roundup. I'm Tom Langford. I'm joined by always by Jake Maffo and Sean Fisher and a very special guest today, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Michael Clegg. Michael, how are you? I'm all right. How are you guys? Been missing you. <laughs> Yeah. been so long <laughs> it has been very long indeed we'll start Michael obviously talking about your footballing past what would you say was the earliest kind of inspiration to getting into football um, well I've got three older sisters um, from that so there's like four of us and I just played like straight away just took to it so like under sevens I was playing in under nines and under eights I was playing in under tens I was always playing a school year up um, and then I was at United really early doors, um, can't remember age to be fair. And then I ended up um, from there just like captaining um, Wigan boys in the 14th and 15th season. I was doing really well at Wigan Athletic then as well. So I joined them when I left school. Um, there was always similar to um, similarities with me and the Michael Clegg from Ashton because we was at was kind of at United at the same time but he was older and then was at Wigan at the same time and I get asked that question so many times so but I was a striker he was a right back and and that was that really. You mentioned there you played for Wigan and United what was your personal experience of being in an academy? Um, I loved it you know I done I done quite well um, like in the 14s, 15s, 16s ages um, at Wigan. And, and there was a couple of times where I could have moved on because there was like, that was when they were like League One going into championship. So I could have moved on, um, like some had come in from Stoke at the time and, and a couple of other things, but it was local to me and I loved it. Um, unfortunately, like really... Oh. Uh-oh. Before before you cut out, Michael, we we were talking about your youth career with Manchester United and Wigan. What was your personal experience of playing in the academy? It was good. I loved it. Um, you obviously missed out on um, playing with your mates uh, in the local teams and stuff. That was hard. And but Wigan and our school had a decent link, so I was always allowed to play for my school and. We was a very successful school team. We won like the Northwest Cup in the fourth and fifth year. We had a like a really good team. Um, so that was always good that I was always allowed to play school football. So, I mean, my, I loved it. I, I, I don't think I've not got many bad experiences in football. You know, you, you live, you learn and you have your eyes and your lows and it just shapes how you are. So I just enjoyed it all, really. That's good to hear. You mentioned you were a striker as well. What kind of striker were you? Were you a goal scorer, a poacher, target man? Honestly, I was just like a fat Teddy Sheringham. <laughs> <laughs> I just used to peel off into that number 10 and just make things happen. Fantastic to hear that. Um, why, why did your playing career come to, to a halt in the end? Just, just basically what happened. So, like, I, I did that and then um, I... As as I got released from Wigan, I was injured. Mm. So at the time, I probably could have stayed and got a little extension, but I just my time were done there. So I thought, and then to be honest, it was just um, what do you call it? Kind of um, commitment. I'd, I'd I'd kind of done it for that long, and then got released, and then I'm eighteen, and your mates are going out, and they're all things you've sacrificed. And I was injured then, and I just. It, it was different then. I I do always, I never ever look back bitter, but I honestly believe if, if I'd have been in an academy now that there's an under 23 scheme, I, I think I'd have done really well because my, I was like, um, I felt like I blossomed a bit later. Uh, like I was doing well anyway, but I think just if I'd have got my rehab then done right and you, your diet and all that kind of stuff. But then like, Three weeks after being released from Wigan, I'm watching United away at Charlton on crutches in London, drunk with my mates, you know. So I just, 
So when you look at it that way, I don't know. I, I didn't have enough self-control back then, but you're still really young. And I think from 18 to to like 21, 23, 22, you, you change a lot as a person, you know. And I just think if I'd have been in the academies as they are now, I'd have stood a much better chance. Yeah, you mentioned there that the academies have evolved and changed. Do you feel that needed to happen then from when you were growing up? Yeah, because from under 18s to like the reserves and the first team, the jumps, just massive. You're still a boy and and 17. And then I know obviously you get your Rooney and that who burst onto the scenes and your Brandon Williams is and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, for a striker to go and then go from the under 18s to making your name in League One and the Championship, it doesn't happen often. Yeah. Yeah. Um, once you had hung up the boots, you went into management. What was kind of the thought process behind that? It didn't. I'm like any other person. I just fell into it. I was playing um, at Atherton Town, who they was very good at the time. Baz Atkins, who's my coach, was like the captain and centre midfielder. And because Baz was at like Forest and stuff as a kid. So he, he was always a really good player. And then just the reserves manager left. And I just, and my mates were in the reserves. So like I dropped into the third for a few games and kind of just took them for the last 10 games of the season and they were kind of oh well you do that again next year and then we were dead successful and then like another local team come over who in Manchester League Pennington and they offered me the job and then we were successful there but then after I think it was 18 months there I thought I'm too young for this because I was probably only 26 27 at the time it might have even been earlier and I, so I just went back doing my own thing, going, watching United, playing odd game here and there for people. And and then I went back to Pennington, um, done really well. And then it went Pennington, Atherton LR, Coles, and then here I am today. What would you say was one of the biggest lessons you learned early on in your management career? <sighs> There's so many. Um Not to fall out with people over silly things. Um, not to burn bridges. Um not try and it's hard like but the friend situations are hard, like having too many friends there that's hard but you you feel that they're all really bad things as they're happening but when now you look back as where I am today as I'm sure if you ask me in 10 years if I'm still in it what I've learned then I think you just carry on learning but I don't take myself um, too seriously now like if I have a fallout with a lad I'll make sure we're back, like we're all right again within 10 minutes or next session and 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 again like I've said on a podcast I did um, the other month I try and base my discussions on facts rather than opinions and I've found that my managerial time over the last two to three year has become a lot easier since we started videoing games and analyzing games and just giving lads feedback rather than just shouting for any reason and just hearing the sound of your own voice too much without any substance or kind of that's how I like to manage now but if you'd have asked me five years ago I, I wouldn't have done that so I just needed to get better because we were going up the leagues and that demanded more so I've just tried to improve and improve myself as well. Yeah, it was something I was going to ask you a little bit later in the show about data and video analytics, but you brought it up, so we'll we'll talk about it now. Um, why did you kind of get into using it, and what benefits have you seen from it? It's weird because it like without without um, name dropping, like my best friend, um, I lived with him for like three years, and he was playing in the Premiership every week, and we used to live together. So he was playing under Sam Allardyce then. So like he'd send like DVDs home and watch them together while I was having tea and stuff. And so I was already thinking that way then. Mm. Like that was bit that'd have been what two, two thousand and four to two thousand and nine probably. So I was seeing how the game was evolving at the top level because I was kind of in it because I was living with a professional footballer. So. It was already then I was already getting my ideas, but then obviously 11 years later, it's it's gone nuts now, hasn't it? Everyone yeah, yeah. it. So I do feel like I had a little bit of an head start because I've had decent people I can go to and 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 ask and and got friends in the game a little bit higher, like we all have. You can say, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And no different to any other manager with that, where I'll go and try and grab people's ideas and I'm not scared of asking questions. Yeah. Um, so we'll move a little bit forward into your timeline. How did the Everton Collieries job come about? I think 
I mean, if you ask the Avon Coles chairman, he might tell you a different story. But my take on it would be that Coles was in the North West Counties one at the time. And they was seen as they was underachieving a bit. They had a little bit of a budget. It was nothing major. Like my first budget there was £350 a week and you only got paid if you won. So it, obviously it wasn't massive. But I was at Atherton LR who had nothing. And we beat Coles and Drew with them that year. And a few little pe few locals were starting to come and watch LR. And I've got a lot of friends in Atherton. And I think if they would have let it, me go over to another year in LR, we, we might have even gone higher than Coles in that league. And I think Coles couldn't let that happen because LR had been the top dog in Atherton for years. Everyone only ever knew Atherton LR, but now only people ever talk about Atherton Coles. And... So I think it was kind of, they were going to go neck neck to neck again when Coles was seeming then to be the bigger club. And I don't think they wanted to let that happen. And and, and they approached me, it was, a, it was a better run club and they had more aspirations. So I never looked back really. When you took over Abbott and Collieries, what did you envision that you were going to be so successful when you first took over? Well, you don't, do you? And I think if, if you'd have asked, if you'd have said to me, like, where will you be in six years? I, w I wouldn't have thought of this because, like, I always remember coming watching Ashton when I was at Atherton LR because my friend was there, Ian Howard, at the time, and there was a massive crowd on. I think he was playing FC United or whoever it was. And and they're, like, moments that I look back to, thinking, oh, I'd love to be here one day. And and I'd always kind of had a soft spot for Ashton in my head, thinking it was a good stepping stone for me after call. It's weird how it, how it kind of all happened. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't, it, it, the story was just incredible. You know, we, we went in and, and we was asked to get out of the Northwest Counties Division One in three years. And, and within that, we were in the three years, we was in the Evo stick. Yeah. You mentioned there as well, the promotions, you won three promotions with the club as well as multiple cups on the well, uh, on the way. Sorry. Mm -hmm. What do you feel the secret was behind that success? Always evolving, um, always knowing or trying to work out when you thought you needed to put new players in that group and, and letting the club and uh, letting the team evolve and, and and letting people go at the right time, bringing fresh face in at the right time. Um, and it was kind of just, just being relentless and, and and just being non-stop and never looking back, thinking what you've done. It was like, right, what are we going to go for next? What are we going to do next? And I think that's kind of um, some people will probably find me hard to work with in a sense that, like, I just I just push and push and push. And it's not many things in my life where I'm like that, really. Uh, but this is kind of my drug and what I love. So, like, with, with this, I never get bored. You know yourself on a Saturday night, have you got that video loaded? And I just find it hard to switch off with it. So I think once we kind of tasted success that first year, it was just the best feeling ever. And if you could bottle that up and sell it and let people have a taste of it, then they'd know why then you work so hard to go and get the next one. And, and that's just kind of how it happened. Yeah, you've mentioned there, like, kind of the positivities of management. Was there any time during your time with any of your clubs that you felt a little bit low and felt maybe, you know, walking away from it? And how have you dealt with that to come back? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I had two at Coles. I, I, I mean, I had a sulk one night at Earlham and said, that's me done. And then that was, kind of, but when I look back, that weren't even serious. But people always look at that and say, oh, well, he did actually leave one, but that doesn't even enter my head. But we, when was our first year in the Evo stick? We'd been on a little tough run over like December and stuff, and then Clitheroe come to our, come to us one day, and they spanked us five one. Is that my biggest ever defeat? And and at the time, that was me done. But then looking back, they had the two newbie brothers and Kurt Willoughby as a front three, and then look what they've gone on to do. Yeah. You know, so like you, you look back thinking you took an hammer in the three, the, they're three top forwards at conference, North Conference level, and they, they absolutely hammered us that day. And um, that was where I thought I might have took calls as far as I did, as far as I could. So I come home and I said to Mrs. Look, I'm going to like, sleep on it, but I think I'm done. 
Um, cause I'd had a couple of offers around that time going higher as an assistant and stuff. And, and cause I was still young, I wondered if I needed to kind of take stock and go and learn a bit more. Like I'd flew to Evo stick so quick. Yeah. And then I was, I was thinking, is it time for me to go and learn off someone with more experience? But we stuck at it. And then after that, we, we lost two out of our last 28 and won the Integro Cup. So it's just crazy. And then the next year we won the league. So it's, it was crazy, really. You mentioned there your family as well. How important is it for you to have such a supportive structure behind you at home? It's massive, I think, obviously. Um, I've, got, I've got an incredible family, like not just my wife and kids, like my mum, my dad, my sisters and that, and, and my cousins and all that. Like that, you know, they've all been really supportive. But I think when um, your little boys are wanting to come and watch the dad at football, it's it's probably every every man's dream, you know. So we're lucky that my lads love it. Um, my wife's not really into it, but she's had to because she's got two little boys now and I'm mad at it. I've got I've got a stepdaughter at 13 who just say I embarrass her all the time because I'm on Twitter. <laughs> so she stays in background. Um, but no, they're great. And I think when you can come home and kind of... Um, and you've you've took a defeat or you've had a bad day. I think when you see them and spend Sunday with them and that, you, you do sometimes realise it's just a game. But at the same time, they get, they get the wrong side of it where you might be going out on a Saturday night maybe to a birthday party or for a meal with family and friends and you really don't want to go, you know. So they, they kind of get that side because as, as managers and lads at this level, we do take our football serious and it, and it does hurt. But then... I remember like one of the highs at Ashton this year was it was my wife's birthday the day we beat Stafford and we, we had a big meal book that night and like honestly I just enjoyed that night <laughs> so much. Like, at half time all I was thinking is how am I going to smile tonight I don't believe it I was thinking I knew my missus had been watching Twitter thinking oh no my night ruined and um, so that was like a big big turning point for me um, this year when we got that three points and I had a fantastic night that night I bet you did I bet you did as well as talking about kind of people behind you how important has it been for you in your whole career to have such a supportive background staff obviously the staff that you've got with Ashton you've spoke very highly of them is that something you've always had in your whole career yeah, well, I kind of did Atherton Town and, and Pennington kind of with my uncle and a friend. And then as it got serious, it, that, that's been really tough. That's something I've struggled with kind of as we've gone higher, kind of people have dropped off. And and the people who I'm really close with, so that's just the brutality of this side of the game. So, like, I had Warren Jones with me for years, and, and honestly, that he's a fantastic man. He's so loyal. He knows his football. He's at Atherton LR now. I still speak to him like very, very regular and and he even going through like a really busy time at work and, and kind of we, we weren't winning games at Coles and think things just needed to change and it, it wasn't necessarily him. I think just kind of the group needed to see something. So like we asked Warren, did he want to take up another role within the group, which he, he, he wasn't comfortable with because he'd been assistant for so long. So he decided to move on and, and we bought Baz in, who, who was a coach, and we knew like he could really galvanise a, a group of players at that level, football-wise. So then we moved Ealdy up to assistant manager because he was my coach. And I, I think now it's as solid as a as a management group you'll find. Um, we're so loyal to each other. We've we, we've got so we, you know we, we we're literally like family. We spend that much time together away from football planning, prepping, and and we've all got the same drive. But at the same time. It's a really laid back group. We don't get carried away easy when we're winning or when we're losing. We we have the ways that we work. We might bend them slightly, but we and and I think what a couple of the Ashton lads like, but kind of we took for granted because we'd only seen it at calls. If I'm well, I'm always there, and we're all always there. But I mean, if they've got the we've all got the respect to set to to keep standards really high. So if I go out of a room, they don't drop because Baz and Eildy and each are on to them. If me and Eildy and Baz are out and each is about, they know they can't drop them for him. So we've got a really good respect um, going on. And that was the same at, at Albert and Coles, you know. And the lads were gutted when we were when we were leaving. Um, but it's football and we, we all remain really close. You know, a lot of the Abbott and 
Cole's current squad are, are really close mates of mine now because we've had five, five and a half unbelievable years together. Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, the five and a half years after um, you also won. Uh, non-league papers manager of the decade or, or one of the main candidates for it how did it feel to win an accolade like that it's strange because i think them are things for like your mum and dad and stuff like things like that i get a little bit embarrassed embarrassed about because like i i look up to other people you know you've got like your bernard and your john all that i always looked up to neil young at what he did at chester you've got Bill Parker who plays an unbelievable brand of football at altringham and the, yeah. and then like you know Paul Carden at Warrington sets up his team and then you've got the lads up at South Shields who do really well and so I think kind of you look back on on your success well I don't really look back on the success we had to be honest I'm always looking forward but I think once you read them things it, it's really nice to know but football's got got a great way of biting you on the arse if you want to start believing your own hype you know so I'll never become one of them that's that's uh, it's really nice to look back on them, but it, it's always about tomorrow and keeping working and keeping focused and and don't ever become one of them people who people think you know he's took his eye off the ball. They believe in their their own hype really because we, we're just not about that. Yeah, uh, after three hundred games with Everton, why did you feel it was the right time to leave? Funny one. Um, like I just reverted to again, I did a podcast a bit back, and we said it was like healing for me because it was the first time I'd spoke about it. I'd not, I'd not really, ref- I'd not really spoken to many people about it um, because it was tough. It was a really emotional decision. It, it was more than football. It was my hometown football club, and all my friends go watching them, and I've, I've be- people have become my friends. People that are coming to me wedding, they, they've seen my lads grow up. It's so it was, it was just such a such a tough decision. But when I spoke to David and Jonathan, I knew it was where I wanted to be. So I'd we'd done incredible things at Coles, and 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 there's some lovely people there, and. We've had amazing times, but the time was right for me to go, and I argue that till I was blue in the face. I, there was a couple of points last season, um, highs and lows, and I just remember we drew at home to. But I don't miss don't miss many games at all. I was I was ill against Buxton, and um, I couldn't get to the game, which is not like me. I've pro- probably missed five games in five and a half years, and um, and and then like kind of there was a bit of like grief coming in saying. You know, I can't believe we've drew one all at home to Buxton and like with the facilities we had, the budget we had so compared to Buxton and I thought, I don't think there's going to be many much pleasing these lot anymore, yeah. you know, and I, that, that weren't the majority of them, don't get me wrong, that was only one or two, some fantastic people and I didn't like that and to be honest, I, I couldn't stop thinking about that for a few weeks and so in my head I was thinking, this could be my time and then... We, I think a game were called off the week after. Oh, no, no, sorry, the week after was Boston. So I've gone in to team meeting Thursday and just hammered them. Like, and it's not really like me. And I've said, you know, I need to pull our fingers out and we need to get back to who we are and and, and what we stand for. And Boston come and, and we beat them 1-0 in the FA Trophy. And if there was ever a game to sum up Averton calls in my five and a half years, I've said that before, it was that game. We was relentless, we was hard working, we were quick on the break, we were horrible. They was hating every minute of being there and that was us, that was what we was all about. And and that and that night I stayed in the clubhouse with family and friends and, and had a few beers before I walked home and it was probably the happiest I've been in a long time. And um, But I just, it, it, like you have moments, don't you, where... You, what you look back and I remember saying to my wife, I, yeah, I don't know what more I can do here. I really don't know what more I can do. I think I'm going to go at the end of the season. So she was like, you can't do that. Like, you, you know, you love it there and blah, blah, blah. And then on the Monday night, yeah, do some, like, well, I don't normally talk about transfer targets and all that, but I'll try and get a bit more in the with this interview. So I knew Aaron Knight was... Um, was doing really well at Stockport Town and my friends at Crew. So my friend rang me and said, listen, Aaron Knight's training with us at Crew. He's, he's a good lad. You need to come and look at him. He do really well in that in your call side. So I went and watched him. And that night, John will, will tell you the, the same story. So I seen John all there and he said, oh, um, Jody's been sacked. So joking, I said, I know I'll see you at training Thursday. Just totally joking. I'd left my phone in the car and I never do that. It's like he's glued to my hand. And then I went in the car. I went at half time. I'd seen enough. 
and I got in the car at half time and I had two missed calls off a number I didn't know and it was David, the chairman. And, and then it just kind of snowballed. I met him the next morning. I let Coles know I'd met him. And then I said to Coles, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know in 48 hours. And then we let him know when that was that. Yeah, yeah, we will we will talk a little bit more about, obviously, moving Ashton in the next section. But just to finish this one off, if you had to pinpoint one moment in your whole career up until that point that you could relive and kind of just experience that whole day again, what would it be? It was, um, do you know what? It was, I went watching um, Farsley against Trafford in, that would have been the Integral final then, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. in the Integral final. And that night, a few of us went to what, no, me and each just went to watch that. And Colm were playing Radcliffe and Colm beat Radcliffe and we were nip and tuck for the Evo stick. And our phone, me and each just were saying, we're not looking at that score and our phones were mad and we knew. And, and I think it's the, we knew we'd won the league that night and, and I didn't sleep. Like, I watched that was going mad and I'm like, lads, we need a point from the last two games. Or the last three games, we needed a point or two points. And they're like, no, it's done. We're going to smash such a body Saturday and then we're going to win it at home to Trafford on Monday in front of a thousand. And that's what we did. And that, that two weeks of going away to Skem, it was boiling. We beat them. And then it was boiling at, on the Monday and we won it against Trafford in front of about 900. And and then the parties, what went on from that, we like had a party every night because yeah. it was just it was just a mad, mad two week. And, and it, it, it's for lifting, the tro- lifting the trophy at home at, at Atherton in front of all them people that day was just so special. And... And the, the times what you'll never ever forget, and, and that's why I always go back to like there, there was a lot of people who were upset I left calls, and there still is a lot of people upset, and there's still a lot of people there who'd love me to not do well where I am, and that's just what I've always struggled to get my head round. But it it's all that's done now, and it, it's all in the past now. And Ashton, man, but their memories will live with me forever. Yeah, sound some sound like some fantastic times. We will move on to our next section, a new game show that we've come up just for you called Watch What You Say, Gaffer. Right, so this game is very specialised for Michael in general because like we've done in previous podcasts, we've done it with Chris Rowney where we had our specific game for him. This one is very much for you, Michael, where we are going to present to you 10 quotes from specific managers all across the game and you're going to tell us which manager you think it is. Like I said off air, like there are, is a manager that comes up a couple of times and you might recognise one from quite close to home yourself. But anyway, I'm going to start off with one, which is quite straightforward, I would say. The first one we're going to give you is, this manager says, please don't call me arrogant, but I'm European champion and I think I'm a special one. Mourinho. It is. It is Jose Mourinho. Uh, second one. He's six foot something, fit as a flea, good looking. Ian Holloway. There we go. <laughs> Couldn't even, so, couldn't even get through it. the full quote. He knows it. Beautiful. <laughs> Moving on then. I couldn't be more chuffed if I were a badger at the start of the mating season. It's got to be Ian Holloway. <laughs> Ian Holloway again. Three out of three. He's on a roll. I wouldn't say I was the best manager in the, in the business, but I was definitely in the top one. Clough. Yep. It's yeah. Brian Clough at Forest. If you get this one, I would be surprised. Um, I don't give a toss what he says. I won't <laughs> accept his apology. He's totally out of order. In British football, you shake the manager's hand, and I think he showed a, lo- a lack of class. I don't think I'll go into a- my office until he's gone. Warnock. Wow. Fair wow. enough. Fair oh, enough. Just, just a little one off the, off the bar here. Uh. <laughs> If we weren't to include you, Cleggy, like this is to- he is Tom's idol. Ah, oh, Neil Warnock. <laughs> yeah, it's between it's between Michael Clegg and Neil Warnock. He's it? a legend, isn't he? He's done so well. He's so underrated. He gets every team playing. <laughs> he does. He does. Right, we'll move on to the next one. Title fight. Title fight. Get in there, you beauty. It's a tough one. This one, I didn't. Kevin know. Keegan. Oh no! It's it's Sean Dyche after Burnley were linked for the title race. All oh, right, <laughs> fair news. Um, this one's a tough one as well. This is from this season. It was a post-match press conference, and he misheard what the 
the uh, reporter asked him, and he went, "How's the bacon?" Steve Bruce. It is yeah, Steve yeah. Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> um, another quite famous one. I love it if we beat them. Love it. Kevin Keegan. 100%. <laughs> Have you ever had like a meltdown like that on a post? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know what? I always try and remain calm because, like I said, this has got a funny way of having you this game. So I, I, I do, I do want to at times, but I just take a deep breath and and think I can't do that because you'll never live it down. So you have just got to take take a deep breath. It'll end up on Robin's roundup next year. That's what happened. <laughs> Uh, the next quote, every dog has its day, and today is wolf day. Today I just want to bark. All away. It's all yeah. away again. And the final quote here is, it was magic seeing that. He's coming to the cauldron of fire there. Like <sighs> I said, this one might be quite close to home. That's me about Tom. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Nine out of ten. Yeah, smash that. smash that. Get in. Fair enough. That's called being boring. It is. <laughs> How many <laughs> press conferences do you watch? <laughs> yeah, I'm boring. Now, nah, well, that was a good, good little game there. Hopefully, we can bring yeah, it up like sometime that. in a different way. But yeah, no, that moves us very on nicely to uh, to Sean. Do you want to take it away, second second part? Yeah. So this section is just going to be talking about kind of this season and also how you are as a manager. Um, so we were obviously were speaking to Greg and Chris in previous shows and they have both were eager to mention like your aura and your character and you also mentioned obviously one of the lessons you learned was not falling out with players. How much do you emphasise that like being on a personal level with the players you manage? I think it was something I touched on earlier at Ashton. Again, I, I'm sorry I keep going back to Atherton but it's because it's I spent so long there and learned so much there but we always knew what each other did as a job. We all knew each other's if each other had kids or what we did outside of football and I think that's just absolutely massive to know to know the person before the player and I think when I got the Ashton job that was one of the first thing I'd do like you know give everyone just a personal call introduce yourself try and find some common ground and and, and try and kind of weigh up what's what and, and what type of characters you have and stuff and and that takes a while because not everyone wants to put the cards on the table some on the first day i'll tell you everything some will tell you nothing some want every excuse under the sun some don't want to make excuses and and, and want to prove themselves so it's just um like i say I, I like building up that personal relationship listen i know managers at our level below and above who don't have some of the players numbers and their assistant does it and things like that i that's people's um, way of working, but I like to get about my players and know what makes them tick. Fair enough. And oh, as as you introduce yourself to Ashton, like, what was your first impression of the squad? Um, mature. It was like they were a really, really nice group. Did things right. Um, they were. They were. They was like it was very like we we had like at, at calls. It was like organised chaos. Like we had so many characters, but. But they knew that once we hit that training time or that match time, everything just stopped and we just focused on winning. Where with Ashton, I come and it was all very laid back. You know, like I could go cold and I'd have like someone would have robbed me bag with my laptop in when I've got a presentation. I'd be lucky, you know, just on it was constantly always I'd be watching what you were doing all the time because everyone was having everyone about everything and you couldn't switch off where at Ashton it was a lot more mature and I think they had adjust my style a little bit. Um it just, just little thing like you know you got people in there like Luca and Josh and all they've played at all kinds of levels and and the lads who you respect as well so they might want things a bit quieter. They they've got their own routine. So at first it's just the feeling out process. Let them do what they what they do and then when things start happening you don't like you've just got to step in and, and get them told. Yeah. And when you obviously first came in we were underachieving a bit. Was there anything you pinpointed specifically on that you wanted to improve straight away? Um, I thought just we needed some more legs in the team and to get some of the lads who were there fitter and sharper and and kind of just change your mindset and then and remind them where they are and why they're there. You know, it's um, it was an horrific run they was on. And then 
you know, you can cry all you want as a manager, but I, like we were so unlucky when we come in. Baseford away, they, Baseford deserved to win, but we was unlucky. And then FC, we never deserved to lose. But in between that, we had the Stafford and the Colts game called off. So in between that, I, I personally I thought we would have picked up points, and then FC come we were mega unlucky, and then we got the nil nil at Staley Bridge, who were flying at the time because they'd won seven out of nine. Best game of the season, though. Yeah, and then South Shield come, <laughs> and even though we got beat two nil, we gifted them two early goals. But other than that, we had a lot of the ball and done done pretty well. So it was. It was hard because of the games what got called off in between. They was the top four at the time, weren't they? Yeah. And so it, it couldn't have been tougher. And then to add to that, you'd left your squad at Coles, who who then your your like they'd knocked on and kind of won a game. So personally, me and my staff, we you, the, it was becoming a pressured month. So it was tough. It was really really tough. But I I knew that it would turn round because. And we're not a quick fix management group, us. We knew that. We're never going to be a quick fix because we give a lot of information and there's certain ways we want to play and that just can't happen overnight. So we had a lot of 11 v 11s. We had a couple of friendlies training nights. So it, it was basically like a full pre-season until we got going. It'd been like six weeks and we'd had, like say, a few games and a few games behind closed doors type thing. So once we kind of hit Stafford from second half, I think we took off there. Yeah, definitely. And you talked about that relationship with Coles and the players there. You obviously brought a few players in that you'd previously managed. What qualities did you kind of see in them that you wanted to bring across? Well, I mean, Greg's just the best keeper around. I'll argue it. I'll argue it with anyone. He's. I, I, I've worked with him now for a couple of years, and he's unbelievable. That he's so good. So I, I knew what Greg had bring, and I think it was instant with with Greg. He's become an instant hit, and rightly so. Um, Bruce is still young. He's local to Ashton, and I wanted to bring a couple of local lads in because uh, I just feel it helps with the club, and you get a couple of lads in who understand what we're about. So that was a no-brainer because for me, he's very good at what he does. And then Ben Hardcastle was Evo Stick Player of the Year. I've had him with me since he was 16, so he was always going to come as well. And I, I felt for Ben a bit last year because at Coles, he's kind of just known as the lad who, you know, him, Jordan Cove, and Mark Battersby, Tom Bentham. You just you Vinnie Bailey, you just go to them whenever you needed win a game and they'd win you a game and it just happened so naturally. And with Ben, we, we had to pay a little fee for him, getting him out of his contract and then I think he come with that pressure and then he's an Averton lad and some of his mates stayed at Coles and we didn't win early and Coles were still winning and it was really tough for Ben. Um, and Ashton definitely haven't seen the best of him. Um, but one thing with Ben is he trains hard, he works hard, he never lets you down. And, and, and you've got a lad there who will go and get you 10 plus goals next season. There's absolutely no question about that. And I think we only seen glimpses of him um, this year, but he, he, he's still so young and he's such a good player. And he's become one of the lads now there and he's really enjoying his time with us. Yeah, definitely. And in bringing these players in, did you want to kind of bring that style that you, that you played with Coles or did you kind of adapt it to the squad at hand? No, I, I thought, we, you know, we've obviously Sam Sheridan and, and your Josh Wilsons and, and your Lafardus and that. The players are really, well, JP is a very underrated player. That lad could go very far if 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 he worked on a couple of things and he knows that I think a lot of him, JP, and he's kind of become the lad who who I've said to you, you ain't going to have an easy day with me now because I've seen how good you are, so I'm going to push you until you're not at this club and you're higher because you should be. Um, so he's been the one who's kind of had the brunt of me, really, um, a lot because I believe in him so much. Um, but no, it was kind of seeing what we'd got and, and, and feeling it out straight away. Um, I just think with, with Brewster and Greg, you knew you were putting 25k of legs in the side straight away. You've got to have legs at that level. But then I think they come and Rowney thought, who are these? So it up Rowney's game, up Shez's game, up, and everybody just up the game, you know. So it was good because straight away the lads will tell you Ben and Brewster are winning everything in training. Every every run and what have you, and and that's sometimes not easy for them when you come into a new group and the older lad thinking who are these, you know. But then I think all the time they earn the respect, and now they're massive parts of the team. Yeah, definitely. And you talked about your relationships at Coles and how is it like a big community. Similarly, Ashton 
kind of base himself off a community aspect. How important do you think that is as a foundation for success? It's massive, and that's what I want to improve on next year, and and that's what I was talking um, to the chairman, uh, to Jonathan and David both from about on a call on Tuesday. Like we we want to go somewhere in pre season and play a game and have a night out, and we want you media lads to be part of that, and and we want you to come closer to the lads, and we want you know the chairman be able to speak to the lads and have a beer with them, and so that's something that we've we've spoke about doing in pre season and. You know, we just want to be able to 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 get along and and do things together. And but I think what happened last year is we we come in at, at a time where I, I spoke up um, with this the chairman like the club didn't really see the real meal the Baz and each us early on. We were coming to do a job. So what we didn't want to do is be the one saying, oh yeah, they're all right. You know, they stay behind for a beer. We want to come in and get a job done and we'd worry about what people thought of us later. And I think next season, you'll see our families there more. You'll see us staying in clubhouse till late and later and you'll see all that. But this year that was really hard because we came in and had a job to do and we didn't want to seem seem to be just nice people who were just who were just there and we were all right we wanted to get everything right on the pitch before we started um doing the the other stuff and integrating with the fans and and all that but that'll be something that will start from day one next year and you speak so highly of jonathan and david was their kind of like project that pitched you was that one of the main reasons you wanted to join they're unbelievable people um, they, I've got so much time for them, and, and um, my relationship already with them two is very different. Like the the calls chairman were fantastic to me, but he left me alone. I I didn't speak to him ten times in five years about football. He just completely left it all to me, and he was always there if I had any problems. He was he was great with my family. He was great with me. If I had any pro, like I, I could give him a call at any time. But he's a very very laid back man now. Jonathan and David are the same, but we we kind of never switch off, all three of us. So we're always thinking about new things and we're always wanting to chat about what's our plans. And I've I've enjoyed that side. I've I've felt like I've stepped like I've I'm I'm manager of the football club, so I've got people to answer to and I've really enjoyed that. And and like they took us out some um some dinner in in Manchester with our wives and stuff and um and you know the bonds the bonds good and it's football though it's a results business if I lose 10 on bounce it, it you don't have a job it's just how it goes but that pressures um I've enjoyed that because I think at Coles probably we'd lost that a bit and 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 that's that's because we probably always bought ourselves time with what we'd done and and you know, um, and Jody probably thought the same. Who who done incredible things at Ashton as well. So you know, it, it's hard football because someone like Jody lose a job is someone I, I I I get along with. So, but also at this, you knew that this was a good job to take. So you know, even though you get on, it was a job that probably anyone in the league would have took at the time because you know how amb- how ambitious the club is. Yeah, definitely. And you, you spoke about that last Stafford game and how it was one of the highlights. Would you say that's your highlight of your time, Ashton, so far? Um, I felt like the Scarborough home win were big. I felt I breathed then. I, th- I thought, yeah, yeah you know, because I knew then we had Mickelover on the wet, on the Tuesday. Was it did Mickelover for follow Scarborough? Because we had Whitby, Warrington, Scarborough, Mickelover, and and when we beat Scarborough, I thought beat Mickelover Tuesday, and, and we could go on a right run and finish strong. And so Scarborough felt big, but then so did Lancaster, so did Morpeth. Morpeth were good because it was a big coach trip, and 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 how emphatic the win was. Um, that was really good, and we needed that. We all got to know each other that day. Um, but Stafford will always be big because it's it's your first it's your first win at your new club, so that that's that's one I'll always remember. I think that really nicely rounds off this season and just like a bit about how you are as a manager and how we can look forward to the future. But uh, before that, I believe you've got a little section on spill the beans, just some quick random quick fire questions to fire at you. <laughs> Right, so now we're going to play a game that we've been playing quite regularly. Um, Spill the beans, a simple selection of questions where we get a bit of a light-hearted answer, hopefully, from you, Michael, like <laughs> we have in the past. Um, 
first question I'm going to ask, going straight into it, is who would you say the best player is that you've managed in your career? Oh, oh, that is tough. Before I come to a- before I come to Ash, and that'd have been easy. Yeah, but there's there's a couple of really really good lads at Ashton. But why mm. I'm still there, I'm gonna leave them out and send Mark Battersby at Atherton Collieries. Okay, is that for skill or is that just for overall? Like- Unbelievable. He's ended up having a couple of kidney transplants, which stopped him playing. Okay. If he wouldn't have had them problems, he he's football league. He, it is unbelievable. Everyone will tell you that. Scored like 127 in 120 games for us, but he's not even that quick. It's just, and he'll score scissor kicks, free kicks, penalties, headers, 30 yards, lobs, put, put. He's, he's so good. I have to give him a look on the football manager. Very, 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 very. <laughs> I'll try and dig out some of his Coles goals and I'll send them over. You'll like them. Sounds good. Um, second question, we kind of all already went through it um, earlier, one game you could relive, um, but we'll restrict it this time just to uh, Ashton. So one game, you've got to li- relive the whole day, what day would it be? it would been more of the way, million yeah. percent. Completely yeah. agreed. <laughs> 100%, yeah. I think uh, and then moving on to, I feel this is quite a highly anticipated one to be honest, worst haircut <laughs> at the club. Well, you know, he's not even called Ben Hardcastle in the changing rooms now. We call him Ben Langford. (laughs) (laughs) You took your hat off after a game and your curtains fell out and we were calling you twinning, so we call him Ben Langford. (laughs) (laughs) So Ben Langford's is the worst. (laughs) Can't believe it. (laughs) That one is getting off lightly there as well. (laughs) <laughs> but I like Rowney, he's one of my favourites, so I'm going to leave him out. <laughs> um, right, OK, w- one player that you'd love to sign? What, like, within our league, to make it a bit of a better question? Go on, then. Briggs, South Shields, centre midfielder, captain, unbelievable player. Fair enough, fair there enough. There we go. Um, next question, worst excuse for missing a training session? Tom Bentham... Atherton calls. He texts me saying he's got to cut a cow up that night for the butcher <laughs> the next day. And then he didn't send us a text of him actually cutting the cow up, but he sent us picture message posts him in the group of when the cow had been cut up. So, yeah, it's got to be the best. <laughs> but he gives me a steak out of it, so still picked him on Saturday. There we go. Uh, moving on, one club you would love to manage. How high do you see yourself getting? Um, I think the dream is obviously to go all the way. I think it's happened a little bit more recently. Um, I'm a mad, mad Man United fan, but I, I don't know. I'd love like a proper, like, I don't know if any of you know it, but have you watched any of the way that Brentford's being run at the moment? With all the stats and stuff? Yeah, love it. Yeah. Brentford. I want to manage Brentford. Weird, weird answer, but I'd love to work for that. Like, no, to, I like that. And that set up, it's yeah. it's um, love watching little clips on them and how they're doing things, and it's it's really really good. So the dream would be Man United and England, obviously for anyone. Yeah. Um, but I think like a, like a Brentford type who who are on a are on a journey and doing things a certain way, it'd be great yeah. getting involved in something like that. What if Liverpool came calling? <laughs> well, I've got a lot of scouts, mate, so I'd, be, be, I'd have to give away too many free tickets. So sad. <laughs> um, I mean, I feel I don't know if there's someone that beats this man, but who is who would you say is the teacher's pet? At, at, um, at Ashton, all yeah. time for you. <laughs> well, everyone will always tell tell Ben Hardcastle, but I think. The bet the teacher's pet has always been Dave Sherlock. He's a lad we had at, at Coles, and again, he, he he just always did a job for you wherever you put him on the pitch. Um, amazing person off the pitch, a school teacher, a good lad, loyal. He, he just used to turn up for training. Honestly, pre season, I used to tell everyone this: you didn't even ever discuss money with him. Like he'd get his first like wage at season, and he'd say, "Is that what I'm on?" I'd say, yeah, go. Is everyone else roughly on that? I'd say, yeah, he said, no probs. That's it. <laughs> that was it. And That's like, easy. 
just a brilliant lad um, who, who again, come come to us when we were pretty low and just evolved every year. Like in in the first year with us, he's probably one of our unfittest, and then by the time I left Coles, he was he was one of the fittest. So it just is. His willingness to work hard for us as a management group and as a team and as his teammates. And I think they really rare qualities these days. Like he, he didn't have a Twitter account. He never posted stuff. He'd get man at match. He wouldn't retweet it. He'd, he'd have a big game. He'd happily let other people take the headlines. And there's just not many people like that now. There's literally not many people like that. So if you're watching this show, you my favourite. Oh, very modest man, he sounds like. Great fella. Lovely. Um, next question. We've asked this question to pretty much every guest we've had on, and we've had some um, brilliant answers um, for it. If there was a movie to be made about your life, what oh. would the title be, and who would play you? <laughs> oh, wow. That I, don't is... watched, I don't know if you watched last week's, but Chris Rowney's going to have Rowan Atkinson starring in, uh, Rowan Atkinson starring in Miss. A spin-off, a spin-off goal. <laughs> uh, wow, that is a good question. Um, oh my god! Wow, I'm I'm honestly I'm not a film man. I've not got concentration for it. I end up watching football on my phone <laughs> or doing something else. Um, be called Never Switch Off. Uh, that'd be played by Will Smith. All right, Will Smith. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. We're going block. block. Still, right? <laughs> you know, I think would suit him. What's the guy that played Brian Clough in? Um, oh, United. United. Thingy Sheen, is it? Michael yeah. Sheen. Yeah, I will have him then. I will have him. <laughs> That'll do. I'm not up with my film. Sorry about that one, boys. Crap. Yeah, out. That's all right. Uh, back to the squad. Who do you think's the best dressed of the club? Best dressed. <sighs> We have to know who's worst dressed as well, then, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Best dressed. To be fair, we've not been on a proper night out. We've always been in our track suits yet, so I'm I'm yet to see it. But I'd imagine. I know Brewster likes putting his hand in his pocket for a nice little pair of trainers and a nice polo shirt and that. He likes his designer names. Yeah. Um, worst dressed Eildy all day long. <laughs> <laughs> we went for no, a, we went we went for a team meal and kids are coming about seventeen layers. He kept taking tops off and tops off. Um I think to, to be fair, a few have a few have got a bit like a few of them. So I, I think Brewster likes his names, but Rowney's a bit of a cool guy actually. He needs to lose them hats though they're poor but he always dresses nice but and Josh Wilson's Mr. Cool isn't he? He is. Mm, he yeah, is. love Josh. He's he, he's a great lad. We'll go with Josh. He's just Mister Cool, isn't he? <laughs> Who's your biggest inspiration in football? Like as an ex ex manager or an ex player? Um, uh, I, I I hate saying this. I really, really do. Like obviously Fergie's everyone's, but I really like Klopp. And the the book I read, the Barcelona way. Although it was about Pep, that was about Barcelona and the culture, and that's so why I really like the Barcelona culture side. Which bit of a boring answer everyone does, but I love Klopp. I just, I think. Can you, we quote that? Can we quote "I love Klopp"? Was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you just know, like after you after they've played a game, you can see the connection with his players. You can see that they genuinely enjoy playing for him, and. You can see they run every yard for him, and think he protects them well in interviews, and and he's got a style of playing where he's just relentless. And 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 this weren't just at Liverpool because I'd watched a few things on him when he was at Dortmund, and he used to have a thing called crash bang wallop, I think, and he's saying like as soon as he wins the ball back, he wants to be in um, opponent's um, box within three passes within a certain amount of seconds, and just ex like um, rocket like. It's like what do they call it? That rubbish music, heavy metal, like heavy yeah, metal football. Yeah. And um, so I, I do, I really, really do like Klopp. I was gutted when United didn't get him. Uh, that's an interesting. I, I hate answering that. I, hate, interesting... I hate myself a little bit, but there's nothing <laughs> I can do. I've been honest. No, there's nothing wrong with liking Klopp or loving Klopp. However you <laughs> wanted to word it. Um, I'm just, I'm just gonna go off script here a little bit, but. If there was one manager you would like to manage United, who would it be? Um, I, t to be honest, I wanted Mourinho. 
And then when you look back and he finished second and he said it's his biggest achievement, you look back and it was done well, but he, he'd lost it, you know, with the Pogba situation and all that. And I think now players are more powerful, so it's I think it's going to become harder for Mourinho as time goes on now um, because he wants to be the main man, but with players how they are, you, you know, you can't always... You can't always do it. Um, so I'd, I'd love Klopp now. Um, I did want Mourinho and we got him and that didn't work out. So they're, they're, my two, they're my two answers, really. I do like Eddie Howe as well, you know. I think he'd do all right, given a bigger and better job. Um, mm. I like watching some of his stuff. But I honestly think in football, you've got to move when the time's right. And I think he could have missed the ball. You yeah. look at Bournemouth now, they're struggling and that. And he's got... He, he hit the ceiling with them, and I think he should have got out when he can, when he could have, and I, I think he might struggle now. Definitely. He, he's, he's really young as well, though. He's got a lot of potential, is not he? Yeah, but I think when he was getting touted for all them jobs, he should have gone. Yeah, he got touted for like Arsenal at one point, isn't he? Spurs, he was ever linked with, weren't he? And I just think, you know, there comes a time, sometime football, if you keep saying no, you just get forgot. Yeah. 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 All right, well, final question in this round. Um, if football wasn't, your profession, what do you think you would have like played in as a sport or managed in or something? Well, I you I my dad told me to boxing gym like when I was young and I hated it. Like I absolutely hated it. And then I started doing it with some of my mates like just as I was leaving school and just as just I left school and I loved it. Um yeah. so I definitely would have would have been boxing. Fair enough. Very nice, nice way to round off that little round of spill the beans. And it takes us very nicely into our final round, which I'm going to talk about ending the season and the future that you've got planned, hopefully. Um, but yeah, no, taking it from Sean's last thing you spoke about was the Stafford game. And then you've spoken about how Morpus was a massive game. And it's it really did seem like Ashton, I, I, I can't quite remember off the top of my head, but as the season was ended, Ashton were right at the top of the form table, weren't they? And it was going yeah. really well. How yeah. was it for you and the team for the, for the league to end? Because... It was you were in no man's land potentially for going up or going down, really. But how did it feel that it was ended still? We we were so excited, like looking forward to some big games. We still had like FC United away. We still had Everton Coles, which had, had now had become a bit of a game for us. It won't be next year, but it was like this year. And we still had like Warrington to go last game at season, who probably would have been playing for something. And we was in a really good place. Like I, I was gutted, like. I, I was gutted and it, it was kind of my last night to work with Billy, who we'd extended a loan till the end of the season because you didn't get a chance to say your goodbyes properly and thank him. Obviously, he's had the phone call since, but if you, you just didn't know it was ending that night and you've not seen the lads since that, mm. you know. So it, it, was, it was in a really good place. It was in yeah. a really, really good place. I thought we, we were looking more exciting. Don McHale would just start and find his feet and would have been exciting for us towards end of the season. I think with the pressure of off, off you'd have seen a real Ben. God, remember, I come in, Liam Thompson was on a holiday. Then he had a four, three or four game ban. You'd have seen the best of him. And then, you know, it, we, were, we were getting there, weren't we? Lafardi were just back from his ban. JP were playing well. John had lost all his weight and were flying Greg were flying and I really do think we could have ended the season really really strong and, and that could have been the catalyst to, to take us in but at the same time I think it's left us all with a good taste in our mouth we're all wanting a bit more now for next season so yeah. we've ended it on a high we was in great form top at form table and it would cut from beneath us and nothing we can do so we can only look at it as a positive and it, it, it gives lads a really good break and and it gives lads a chance to consider what it is they want to do do they want to go and play for the local club do they want to do they want to stay do they want to leave what is it they want did they enjoy the time with us they've got a lot of time to reflect so i think it'll um i think it'll be good coming into pre-season if, if that goes back at the time like the normal time that we think which i hope it does well without um, moving on too much about ashton itself how do you feel like the decision was to abolish the league as a whole. Do you think about well, stepping on eggshells here and I think was it the right decision, would you say? Tough one because I think I still think there's a lot to play for at the bottom. Mm. I, re I mean, coming up to the Saturday that we got called off, um, we had Grantham mm. and Coles had Stafford and that could have been a big weekend. 
that could have been a really big weekend. So I think there was still a lot to play for down there. I, personally, I would have never said it at the time. I thought we were done. We there were no way we were going down. We was only going one way. Then we was on it. But the top as well. I, <sighs> South Shields have got to be absolutely fuming. Have they ended up like 10 points clear or 12 points clear with like nine games to go or something? I think it was 12 in the end. Yeah. And it was very clear to see they were the best team. Oh, the league, so. I mean, and, and consistently the best. Yeah. And, and consistent. Like, so they've got to be good. For me, I mean, they'd be a credit to Conference North with the crowds. They've got the money, you know. And, and to be honest, that. I think they'd do really well. They, they'd obviously be strongest candidates in our league again next season, but I don't think we've heard, heard the last of this because I think if they do the playoffs in the Conference North and promote, I think they're going to struggle to tell the teams lower that they can't go up as well. It just seems so unfair. Relegation's another issue. Um, I think that I don't know what they do with that, but the teams at the top, with the money they've spent and what they've put in, I think seems so harsh to kind of let it go. It is harsh. It does seem harsh. However, on those negatives, there are somewhat positives that you could kind of take from it. And one of the things is, would you say you've been able to spend more time with family and maybe take your head off football for a bit? Or yeah, that's still at the forefront. No, well, to be honest, it, it's kind of been a bit half-hearted, the football, because you're speaking to potential players and stuff and you can't give them dates and you can't give them, but we just don't know that much. So I'd be lying if, if I said I hadn't spoke to a few potential new signings. I'd be lying if I said that. Um, I've got around all the squad. They know where they stand um, with me and my plans. So there's been a couple of, well, a few who've already gone. Um, there'll be a couple who'll probably still go as pre-season comes and stuff because that's kind of how football happens. And I always leave room for one curveball in, in pre-season. Someone always comes in who you don't expect and who does well who you didn't expect. So as term in terms of planning like that, um, I've not got that carried away with it because we're pretty happy with what we've got. We, we definitely need to add, but we, we're pretty happy with the group on a whole. Um but no, I've, I've absolutely loved spending time with the family and and that it's been it's been great because I think as managers, we we never really get time to take our head off. You're always thinking whether it be Saturday night, Tuesday driving training, then Friday preparing for Saturday, and then if you've lost on Sunday, you're down in dumps. So not having that has 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 given me some. Um, real good time away from football. I've listened to a few podcasts, like read read a couple of things, and we've planned pre-season sessions and how we're going to do things. And and now it's just waiting um, to see what happens. So I have I have really enjoyed the time. It's the first time for me in in probably eight years that I've had a break and work's been busy before that. So it's been really good spending some some quality time at home yeah i've really enjoyed it to be honest that moves on quite nicely to what what would it be that in normally in a normal situation when the season finishes in between the time it finishes to the start of the season what is your plan like what is your job I do, uh, uh, football wise you mean obviously yeah, football -wise. um just get about the lads as soon as i let them all i always kind of say look, look why don't we all have a good 10, 10 to 14 days off now where we try not to try not to speak about football just completely forget about it um people already know roughly who wants to say then you've got the decision who, who who are not in your plans and then straight away after that you're just on it i mean last year's on holiday and that I'm never off my phone you know speaking to players because you, you, if you if you don't if you want to turn your phone off as a manager for seven days you can miss the boat on some things so it, it it, actually, as it finished, my I wouldn't. That would probably my busiest time, because you'd have Mr. Smith who wants twenty pound extra, Mr. Smith saying all oh, such a teams offered me fifty quid more. So you have all that going on. Um, but I've kind of got to a point now where if you don't want to be here, don't be here. You know, we 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 we've got what we've got and and what will be. You're always going to have lads who who try it on and. And what have you but i think this year is going to be very very different i think it could be the first time in a long time it's a chairman and a manager's market i don't think there's going to be massive money knocking about i can't see any player at any club having a pay rise can't see that happening anywhere definitely not um so there's going to be lads who are going to have to set pay cuts at clubs not ash i mean everywhere um which might then mean that they actually go 
and play where they want to play. They might play for the hometown club, so they're not spending on petrol. Might go and play for a manager they've always wanted to play for, but they've not been able to do because of money. But now it's not there. So you might see a you might see a few shocks this summer. I'd imagine. Um, we're spe- speaking to three really good lads at the moment um, who who will definitely improve us. So it's exciting times. In those ten days to two weeks that you say that you have off, do you get time to go away with your family, or are you? I normally on- I normally try and get away me on the Monday. Like when we normally go to like Tenerife as soon as the season finishes, and then I normally come back from there for a few weeks, and then we'll try and go like Mallorca for four or five days or something. Because we don't I don't really do that in the season. Um, but funnily enough, we meant we was meant to go away um, a couple of. I was meant to miss the Baseford game at home because um, my missus had booked for us to go France and Geneva for a few days, so I'd have missed that. Um, so we 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 obviously got that cancelled. So, but this year, obviously, all this is going on. So it might be the first time in a long time I don't even manage to get away, but. She's been asking me, can we go in October? <laughs> so I'll have speak to German about that. Have you, is, is there any plan whatsoever as to like a date that you may be able to see like the team again and stuff? Oh, all that being set? said is we're going to aim. We're going to just aim as normal for the end of June. Now, loads of people have been really negative and not, not Ashton, I mean, other managers and other players saying, I can't believe you're even thinking about that. But what happens if that does happen? So, so what's everyone going to do? Come back and they're not in shape. And blah. So I'm going to plan for that and, and I'm just going to keep listening to all all the things that go on and and what have you. And then if it comes a time, time it, it, it has to be moved. It gets moved, but I've set my sights personally on the end of Ju- at the end of June to go back. Loads of people disagree with me. A few might agree with me, but that's just how I'm doing it. I just feel I need to set a lad, look, we're going to aim to go back the end of June. And if that changes, then we'll let you know. But that's the aim. To it'll be, hopefully, it'll be business as usual. I'm not sure that will happen, but that's how we're going to plan it, and that's how we're putting it across to the potential targets who who we're going for and, and what have you. Fair enough. Well, we're very aware that everyone's optimistic in the squad and in the backroom staff, and like in the fans and us, us included, about next season. Do you have a long-term plan with Ashton or do you take it year by year? Let's take it game by game. I think it's um, it's such a tough league, the Northern League. Um, I think I've learned a lot this year about certain styles and, and how to adapt and, and and certain players and how to set up and I take it all in. I've you know I've been re-watching videos and not just our games of other teams' games and so I'm just learning and it, it's going to be tough. The, the thing is in the Northern Prem and it it's a cliche if you don't turn up you get beat it's just as simple as that so i think it's about who performs the basics to the highest the most consistent will do well so that's what we'll be aiming to do and have a clear plan of who we are how we play and what our jobs are and and we'll go into every game like that so you know, it's going to be a tough place to come for teams, but we're going to be going to a lot of tough places and we're just going to be set up to be hard to beat. I want to be a little bit more exciting next year. I thought we were a bit boring this year and um, and we'll just see where we go. All right. And for yourself, if you say, it might be a tricky question, this, but give yourself 10 years time. Where do you reckon you'd see like to see yourself? Maybe not in a job, but just as a whole. Just um, hopefully watching... Watching my little boys and my family do, do like have all progressed and and grown up and and and, and excited to see what will kind of happen with that and and I'm lucky like like me and my best mate have got a business together and that's grown like steadily over the last seven years so I'm excited to see where that goes I still get up every morning really looking forward to go to work so work with my friends as well outside of here outside of football and and as a group I'd love to see where me. Um, Ildi Baz, Eachus and and Tom and Kizza and and the, and young Ollie who does our analysis and what have you and Carl and the boys who do the scouting. I, you know, it's just I'd love to see where it can take us because I think you know if if you're willing to work hard and you can win a few games along the way in football, you you know doors open. But I'd love that. I'd love well, to take that short little short term. I'd love to take Ashton to the Conference North. 
Sounds great. Sounds like a good 10 year plan. Meanwhile, I'll hope to get my 5k in 20 minutes by then. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you do. You need to yourself a skinhead, your ears weighing you down. <laughs> You're not the first person to say that. Yeah, you can't right. be running with one of them bands in it as well. <laughs> get it off. Well, Joshy, Joshy gets by. Yeah, he does Ben's, actually. Ben's joined the, uh, the bandwagon now, I don't know if you've seen. Who, Ben Langford? No, yeah, Ben Langford. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's perfect. Has anyone else got anything to add? Or is that uh, yeah, I, I just I just have one question. Um, there's talk as well of uh, games being played behind closed doors. Do you think it will work at the level that we're at? Or, or Can't not? see it. Can't I just can't see that happening. I just don't know how teams are going to afford to pay people and things like that. I mean, we all know everyone has budgets at this level. I just don't see how that works. I really don't. Just hoping that everyone connected with the club, um, Kat especially, gets well soon. I've dropped her a text and what have you. Um, I'm going to give her a call this week, make sure she's all right. And First and foremost, things like that get better. And then... Yeah. I just can't. I can't see how you play at our level without without the fans. It, it that's all that that's what the lads play for, isn't it? Really, and I just exactly. don't see what any of us gain by doing that. Mm. Just for the sake of us playing Northern League football, it wouldn't be the same going South Shields. And you imagine it started off behind closed doors, and you lost out of your FC United and your South Shields gate money and stuff like that. It's just, it, it I just don't see how that'd work. Yeah, perfect. No. Very nice. Well, thanks very much for your company, Michael. And we'll I've enjoyed it, boys. And thanks a lot for your support. And um, since I come in, it's it's massively appreciated from me and the staff for for making us um, feel welcome. Um, we do appreciate it. No well, well, we'll hope, hope to get you on the show again in the next season. <laughs> yeah, but, it, be anyway, a pleasure. Perfect. Well, from me, Tom and Sean, thanks for watching Robin's Roundup and we'll see you soon. See you later, fellas. Thank you.